Hello, Bophiles! Today, we're talking about etude number 10 from the Furling book. I'm going to play it, and then I'll give you some tips on how to work on it. All right, see you in a minute. Alright, so let's get into it. Okay, so this etude is one of my favorites because it's written in a way that really allows you to explore the dramatic aspects of the writing. It's... Let's go through some typical things first. It's in 3-4, so you want to make sure that you're giving beat 1 the emphasis whenever it's appropriate. It's got a lot of rhythmic issues with ornaments, and that's kind of it. The rest of it's pretty straightforward. Um, if you need help on how to work on technical things to just smooth it out in general, I've got a video about that, which I'll link to in the corners above. Uh, but let's talk about things that are specific to this etude. The thing about this etude is the rhythm of the dotted quarter note. Kind of gets people, especially when there's ornaments. So, for example, in measure 4, there's a trill and a grace note on this dotted quarter note. So first, we want to break it down, slow on with the metronome, and practice it without the ornament. So first, you might play it like this. Now, I switched reads a little bit while I was trying to get this tutorial together, so let me know if you like this purple one or the green one I used in the recording better. I'm on the fence. Now that you've played it without ornaments, you can then go back and easily add the ornaments, making sure to respect the rhythmic integrity. When the grace note feels good, put the trill in. And when that feels good, put them both in. Now, keep in mind we're going at a reduced tempo. You need to pick a tempo that is slow enough to where you can successfully do it without having to stress out or get tense. We always want to be relaxed and strong when we play. Now there's two other ornament situations that I want to talk about. The first one is in measure 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The first one is in measure 10. It's got a half note with a trill over it, and then two grace notes that are tongued. So for this situation, I like to stop the trill on a beat to really show the listener where the pulse is. So we might play from the pickup of the measure before. Uh, and that way you tongue the grace notes. When you're practicing this, of course, hold the note without the trill. To get used to the rhythm and really feeling where beat 3 is, even though nothing happens rhythmically there. You can show it with your airstream by spinning the air. A similar situation happens in bar 12, but this time the grace notes are not tongued. So I prefer to trill this one all the way through the half note and then just slide into the next downbeat, which is beat 1. Which remember we want to emphasize and there's a crescendo going into it and a dynamic change which tells you how to bring out the drama. To practice this one, you should do the same thing. Just practice it without the trill first. And really 
show where the emphasis goes. And then put the chill back in. The next issue I want to talk about is this kind of trio section where the piece switches into D minor, which can be awesome for experimenting with different dramatic techniques. The first one is this kind of accent pattern that happens on the upbeats where you get the kind of neighbor tone action. The first time it's slurred in the high octave, but the second time it's tongue. So you might want to bring up the differences there. I like to kind of move into the B flat in the high register and then kind of lift into the B flat in the lower register. Now, a lot of the Ferlang etudes use these high register notes like the F, and it can be hard to practice getting those in tune. If you need help on getting the high notes in tune, I made a Technique Tuesday video about that, which I'll link to in the corners, wherever the eye shows up, and in the description below, so you can check that out if you need help with these high notes. The last section, technically, that I think needs to be mentioned is getting from C sharp to C. It's going to be really tempting, if you're kind of on your own without a teacher, to use your knuckle on the pinky, and that's going to really put a lot of strain on these tendons back there, and I don't recommend that. Instead, focus on getting the ring finger curved so that you can put your pinky onto the C-sharp key and the C key and then just slide off the C-sharp key when it comes. This happens in bar 29, towards the end of the dramatic D minor section, in which we have... And then when you go for that high B flat, you can actually just leave the C key down. And if your pinky is not super strained and creating a lot of painful situations for you, you'll have a better kind of position from which to go into the, the technical section that comes up. Remember, we want to be as relaxed as possible and avoid any unnecessary tension. So again, the C sharp there. Just sliding between the C key and the C sharp key as, with as little motion as possible. So that has a lot of tricky sections. Whenever practicing these tricky sections, make sure that you practice slowly with a metronome and pay attention. And most importantly, make sure you smash that like button below and subscribe if you haven't already. When in doubt, as always, play beautifully.